Hey, Christ Chapel. I hope you've had a great week sheltering in peace, and I'm glad you're back with us today. If we haven't gotten a chance to meet, my name is Owen Ingstrom, and I want to welcome you to Christ Chapel's Internet Campus. I know so many of you are here because of our current circumstances, and you're waiting for the day churches are able to meet in person again. Or maybe you're just hoping to find some peace and encouragement today. Either way, I'm glad you're here. This season may be different, but as we'll hear in just a bit, it's full of opportunity as well. Your church hasn't gone anywhere. In fact, we're here to help however we can. So to start, I wanna make sure you know about a few ways that you can really make yourself at home and be a part of what God is doing in our church right now. First is our Connect card. If you haven't ever filled one of those out at a physical campus or here online, go ahead and fill it out now. Just click Connect in the top right on the Internet Campus homepage or use the link that's being posted in all of the chats. By doing that, we'll be able to send you more info about our church and all the different ways you can connect online. Speaking of connecting online, let me encourage you to join us at Starting Point today. It's the best place to go and have any of your questions answered right away. Those can be questions about God, our church, or anything else. We have pastors and staff ready and waiting to talk about anything that's on your heart. We know things are tough right now, and in case someone hasn't reminded you today, you're not alone, and we're all in this together. If you have any questions, click the link that's being posted in the chats or head to the link on the screen right now, ccbcfamily.org sp. Literally, right now, someone is ready to answer your questions and pray with you. Click that link anytime throughout the service, and we'll look forward to seeing you on a Zoom call. You can also click Live Prayer on the Internet Campus homepage to have someone pray with you. Or simply let us know how we can be praying in the chat. Our team is available to you, and you can always email, call, or text me directly. I know asking for prayer online may feel weird, or you may wonder if we'll even respond to what you share. I promise you, we're praying for you, and we will answer anything you ask us to pray for. I'm not kidding when I say we're in this together, and we're going to God that way in prayer as well. So truly, make sure you let us know how we can pray for you in the chats by contacting me or by clicking live prayer below the chat on the Internet Campus homepage. I'm glad we're all able to worship together online today. So let's head over, and I will see you all back here in just a bit. Hello, Christ Chapel. It is so good to be together today. Uh, in these uncertain times, we're going to take a moment and create some space and to remember that our God is a God who is good and he is trustworthy and he is faithful and he is certain and he is strong. I love this verse in Hebrews, therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. Let's sing to him today. He is unstoppable. Let's sing this.
Amen. Christ Chapel, there is no one like our God. That's why we are here to worship him. That's what you're saying as you've chosen to, to make time to meet with him because there is no one like him. And that's why we worship him. And we're gonna continue to worship him as we take up an offering. And if you've never given online before, that's how Jen and I give, and I know many of you have. But if you've never given online, it's really simple. You can even do it from your phone. You can text in the code right there on the screen to the, the campus that you usually attend, and it'll send you a link so that you can uh, go ahead and just give right there, or you can go onto our website and give. Uh, you giving helps us continue the essential work of the ministry. So thank you for doing that because your giving is making a big impact in our communities and it's making a big impact in individuals, families' lives. In fact, I wanted to tell you one story that touched my heart. I know it will touch yours as well. A story that we heard of a single mother who was caring for her children this past week who needed some assistance. And what made this case specifically unique is this single mother is an elderly widow and she was trying to take care of her two adult children. You see, one of her adult children is, is medically unable to care for themselves, so she is their caretaker. The other one, the other adult child, is a military veteran who has been disabled. So this elderly widow is the caretaker of her two adult children, and she was having trouble taking care of them. In fact, she has Parkinson's. And so we stepped in to assist to help because what we found out was as she was trying to care for them, she couldn't get out and get groceries. So she had rationed their food so that they could only eat one meal a day. And so we heard of that need and with your gifts, your tithes, your offerings, we were able to step in immediately and go to the grocery store and bring home some food so that she could care for her children, so that she could have some physical bread as we provide for her, as you provide for her with the gifts that God has provided for you. So thank you for giving Christ Chapel. You are helping us do the essential work of the ministry, and that's to provide essential things for people that God loves. In fact, let's pray for those folks right now, those folks that, that need his provision, that need to remember that he sees them and he can do great things in their lives. Let's pray for them. God, we are so grateful for what you have given to us, and I know that there are people probably even listening to me now that say, God, would you work that miracle in my life? I, I need to see your provision. Would you step in? Would, would you hear my prayers? Would you hear my cries? Lord God, those people are knocking on the door of the church, and Lord God, I thank you for the church that is giving to provide those needs as unto you. So Lord God, would you hear their cries? Would you enable us as a church to step into those needs to be your hands and your feet? Because there is no one like you, God. And that's what we want the world to see. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. morning, Christ Chapel. Uh, we love you. It is such an honor to get to be here and open up God's word uh, with you this morning. Um, like Cody said, like Austin and Owen before that, we love you. We do. We're praying for you and we're thinking uh, of you a lot. Uh, so please just keep reaching out to us and let us know how we can love you well. Uh, I'm honored to get to dig into God's word this morning uh, in this series that we're in week two of in Philippians 4. Uh, exciting weekend for us. Uh, in the Fuquay household, we found a turtle. And we have two boys who are sheltering in place slash sheltering in peace slash chaos at times. And so to find a turtle in our family was like hitting the lottery. Uh, the amount of excitement that finding uh, this turtle brought was huge. Uh, his name is obviously Speedy. My six-year-old named him Speedy. And, uh, and my six-year-old has made obstacle courses for him, and we've got a kiddie pool that he uh, creates little environments and habitats for him, and my three-year-old likes to poke him with sticks. And so uh, the turtle has brought a lot of excitement to our family and a lot of excitement to our lives. 
Uh, and last night, I was staying up late working on some stuff, and I just had a lot of extra things and kind of problems I was trying to solve, and the rest of the family had gone to sleep. And I, it was just me and the turtle. I was sitting at the kitchen island, and it was me and Speedy the turtle, and we just had this profound moment together, me and this turtle, um, sitting there watching him in his little terrarium. It was a rock that he sits on, and then we occasionally feed him, and that is basically his whole life. He sits in the terrarium, sometimes he sits on the rock, sometimes he floats in the water. Those are his decisions in life. And as I sat there, I thought, wow, Speedy, your life is awesome. You have got it good, man. The simplicity to be a tiny little turtle, uh, wow, what a great life you live. Uh, obviously, it's pretty tongue in cheek, but I had this epiphany uh, just of the complicatedness of our life and certainly the complicatedness of this season in our life. Um, Church, complicated seasons and issues and the way that our lives are built means that we've got complicated hurt and we've got complicated anxiety that isn't just a simple problem, it's layers of a problem and layers of anxiety and layers of discouragement and layers of problem solving. And so one of the things that I get excited about with our passage today is I believe that complicated problems and complicated hurts require deep deep healing and complicated answers and deep truth. And I believe this passage in Philippians 4 does that. And so I'm excited to get to unpack it uh, and hopeful for what he does and, and how he brings hopefully healing and peace and uh, to what could be a very complicated season of anxiety for you. And so I'm gonna read the passage here for you. Paul says this in verses four through seven. He calls us, to rejoice. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What a powerful passage. What a powerful piece of scripture. Uh, it's also potentially a very common passage. It might be very familiar to a lot of people. And in full transparency, one of the things that happens to me when I read a passage like this or a passage that might be pretty familiar, especially in a season like this, is it becomes a head nod passage. And it becomes truth and an answer which I find uh, overly simplistic to an intricately difficult anxiety that I might be wrestling with. And I skip over passages like this oftentimes and just nod my head, yeah, yeah, I, I just need to not be anxious. I just need to not be anxious and I nod my head as opposed to slowing down and going deep and really seeing what God has for us here and my prayer is that we would have fresh eyes to see this truth. And so let me just preview where we're going. I believe there's a command at the very beginning of, of this section of scripture and then the rest of the verses will show us how to live out that command, the how behind uh, the command. And so are you ready? Here's the command. Here's the command that the Apostle Paul and the Word of God has for us this morning. Verse four, rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Awesome. Great. I just need to flip the switch and all of a sudden go from the life I'm living now and all of the circumstances that surround me that make this command intricately hard and just flip the switch and rejoice. Sweet, let's get the band back out here, let's worship. This command is for us who follow Christ. Yet this command is not easy to fulfill in my life. I wish I had the maturity to simply flip the switch and all of a sudden go from anxiety or frustration or discouragement to flip the switch and say, okay, Paul, you say rejoice, then I will rejoice always. It is a difficult uh, thing to do, and yet I believe there is a pathway uh, through Scripture to show us how this happens. Uh, let me bring this a little bit more bottom shelf, this word rejoice. Uh, I think the word rejoice oftentimes can feel like a, a nebulous kind of churchy term. And so just even for our own practical application, uh, that word is heavily connected with the idea of gratitude. Uh, this idea that we should live lives of gratitude and that our response to our God should be one of rejoicing and one of gratitude for what he's done. That's where our rejoicing uh, comes from, that we're filled 
with gratitude. And I think gratitude is a little bit more bottom shelf for me. I can think of rejoice and I can simply turn it into, well, I guess I'll sing some songs or I'll, 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 I'll hear a verse like this and I'll think of a, a childhood song we used to sing in church all the time. But gratitude is something that I think hits a little closer to home to say, okay, how can I be, how can I be gracious? How can I have that sort of gratitude? And that is certainly what he calls us to. The, the big idea that I think Paul is pushing in this passage is that we should have an attitude of gratitude no matter the circumstances, that we should have this attitude of gratitude. I apologize for the rhyming. I've been reading a lot of Dr. Seuss books with my kids recently, has heavily influenced my preaching. Uh, but I hope we remember that, right? I hope we remember and we walk away from this and think, okay, my attitude should be one of gratitude no matter what the circumstances. Um, I, it is not lost on me the audacity of that challenge. It's not lost on me the difficulty that that, um, that, that might pose before us, specifically in uh, the world that we're living in right now and the dysfunction that we're living in right now and all the circumstances that are swirling around that produce anything but gracious gratitude hearts and rejoicing. Uh, but instead, I think in lots of ways and for many people I know and love and even in my own life, magnify the problems. Uh, and yet, here in this passage, he says always. He doesn't say simply to, to, to rejoice when things are well or when it's comfortable. He says always. It's constant. This is, a, this is an active imperative in the Greek that couldn't get any stronger. To Paul says, rejoice. Again, I'm gonna tell you to rejoice and push that no matter how complicated the anxiety is, no matter what the troubles look like in your life. And that is uh, certainly a challenge, but that is the challenge before us as believers. How do we do that? I wanna show you through the rest of just these three verses, verses five, six, and seven, a deep and I think meaningful how to get to this place uh, of, of having an attitude of gratitude. Before I do that, I wanna quickly um, make a couple of observations that I think are, are very encouraging. One of them is, is this. God in this passage is assuming anxiety in our life. In this passage, it says, do not be anxious about anything. God is not surprised by our anxiety, nor is he afraid of our anxiety. And so one of the things I think is important is that we don't have to look at anxiety as something that we just have to fake it and feel bad about. And we just need to put on a mask and pretend that we're happy and pretend that we're rejoicing. But instead, we can see that our God expects that. He sees that coming. Anxiety was something that he is not surprised by and even assumes will happen. But here is a pathway to find freedom from that anxiety. And the other observation that I think is encouraging and incredibly challenging for me is, is there in verse five. Verse five, he says, let your reasonableness, or uh, in Greek, a lot of other translations will call that your gentleness, right? Let your reasonableness or your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. And if it's not enough motivation for me to choose to rejoice, to, to fight to have this attitude of gratitude simply for the freedom that it will bring in my own heart, if that's not enough of a motivation, then I think verse five is a sweet motivation to say, and let that be on display for everyone to see. The witness that we can be as followers of Christ who in the midst of hard circumstances rejoice, have a hope that doesn't make sense to the world around us, putting it on display for everyone to see, not for them to see how great we are and how we have it all together, certainly not to fake it, or to pretend everything is fine when it is not, but to have a deep gratitude in the midst of hard circumstances is glorifying to God. What a beautiful time to be a part of his church. That motivates me, that gets me excited, but still the question remains, fine, how do I do that? How do I do that? How do I just flip this switch to all of a sudden have this gratitude that I'm called to, uh, called to have? Here, here's how. I think there's a hinge that's absolutely necessary in this text for us to start with, and it's in verse five. Before we get there, though, I want you to see two huge commands that rise out of these four verses. There's the command that we already talked about, to rejoice. Rejoice always, again, I'm gonna say it again, rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. We see that bold imperative in verse four, and then in verse six, we see a, it's a potentially very familiar passage, be anxious about nothing. And these two commands really seem to kind of float to the top in this four-verse section. 
I, I think those two commands are two sides of the same coin. I think our call to rejoice is, this, is just a, another side of the coin to our call to not be anxious. Um, I, I would make the argument and I would support it in these passages. I think the opposite of anxiety is not simply peace. I think the opposite of anxiety is to rejoice. And so I think what God is saying here, what the Apostle Paul is saying here, is he's saying, here's your, your challenge. Two sides of the same coin. What the thing that you need to do is to rejoice, the positive. What you need to stop doing is the negative of don't be anxious. And that's verse four and verse six. And right in the middle, verse five, I think is the hinge to understand the how we do that. Look at verse five. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. The Lord is at hand. The Lord is near us. Be anxious about nothing. In between these two commands to find freedom from anxiety, to step into this uh, posture we're to have to rejoice, is this awareness that we are called to to believe deeper that the Lord is at hand. Our attitude of gratitude starts with our trust in his proximity. It's got to start with a deepening trust in the proximity of God that he is at hand, that he is near. The Lord is at hand. The primary solution to our anxiety is that God is close. And let me explain, God being at hand, most every scholar and commentary would, would point out that, that that phrase, that God is at hand, is not a reference to an eschatological return of Jesus, but instead that's a reference to his current presence, the spirit of God with the Philippian church who's going through immense suffering, that they're saying he is here with you in your suffering, and that closeness of that God in your suffering will help put you on the pathway to set you free from anxiety and allow you to be able to rejoice when it wouldn't make sense normally to rejoice. Uh, why is that important? Why is his proximity important to us? Why would that produce any sort of peace because he's close? Here's why. Because of his promises. Because we're close to the God who has delivered the most bold and radical promises in history. And a God who always keeps his promise, and a God who has never left us. That's why being near that God is important. When I was a little kid, I did, um, I played Little League Baseball, and my dad was the coach, and we were the Rockets, and we were pretty bad at Little League Baseball. We had, we had a few good seasons, but for the most part, we were pretty bad. We didn't care, and we didn't really realize that we were bad, which is probably why we were bad, uh, but, but we, we had this team, and my dad was the coach, and my dad being the coach meant everything for me, because me as a little seven-year-old, eight-year-old, nine-year-old, 10-year-old baseball player, my dad was the coach, and this was like late 80s, so he had like the short, short coaching shorts on, and the fanny pack, and the hat, and the whistle, and the clipboard. My dad was the guy who held the clipboard Right? He had the ability to toss a ball to himself and hit it to a bunch of eight-year-olds so we could practice uh, grounding balls. And as an eight-year-old, to see somebody have the hand-eye coordination to throw a ball to themselves and hit it to us, I mean, he hung the moon. He was a legend. He was infinitely better than all of the other eight-year-olds on my team. My dad was the coach. My dad had the clipboard. My dad was in control. And my dad said, I had what it takes. My closeness to my dad gave me the confidence to do what I needed to do, gave me the peace to do what I needed to do. Not geographical uh, closeness, but relational nearness. The relational nearness I had with my father, who was the boss, who said I had enough and who said I was good enough, gave me confidence, made me potentially a slightly better player. I'm not actually sure if it did, but it certainly gave me peace because I knew he's the one who has the clipboard. And he says, I've got it. Our proximity, our nearness relationally to the God of the universe who is in control is going to mean everything for our pathway to get to this place where we can rejoice when it doesn't make sense. Then we can set ourselves free from anxiety that's valid our nearness to that God. Look at, 
Look at just some of the promises from the Lord for those who are near to him. These promises that come attached to the God who, who draws near to us and allows us to draw near to him. Uh, in Psalm 34, 18, he's saving those who are crushed in spirit. He says, for those who are near, he's saving those who are crushed in spirit. In Acts 23, uh, he comes to Paul after a horrible event where Paul is almost ripped to shreds between the, between the Sadducees and the Pharisees and, and they actually have to take him back to prison because he'll be safer in prison and he's having a, a discouraging night and then in Acts 23 it says, the Lord came near to him and gave him courage. Uh, Psalm 73, for those who are near the Lord, God has become a refuge and a protector. Romans 8, 28, he is working all things together for good. Isaiah 54, no matter what. Isaiah 54 talks about the mountains and the hills crumbling. No matter what happens around us, his love will never depart from you. These are promises that come along with the God that we're drawing near to. That's why it's important to draw near to this God because these promises come along with him. Philippians 4.19, which is just later in the same chapter that we're studying, says he's supplying every need. He supplies every need according to his riches in glory. That's the God we draw near to. That is where the beginning of our freedom to have the attitude he's called us to have has to begin. Drawing near to his presence, drawing near to the promises and trusting in those things building our trust that yes, he's good, yes, he's near. What do we do with that? How do we draw near? Um, real simply, we draw near by being in God's word. We draw near by being in God's word. That's where I find God's promises. That's where I see his character. That's where I see that I'm made a new creation. That's where I see that um, there's, now no for, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's where I see all the beautiful truth of who he is and by his grace, who he says I am, and what he will do, and what he has done, if I want to build my trust in the nearness of God, I have got to spend time in his word, his revealed word. That's my challenge for you this week. Would you do that? If you want peace, if we want to rejoice, would we spend time in his word? If you don't know where to start this week, I gave you six passages that I just paraphrased in your notes here on promises. Start there, the next six days, start on Monday, and, and really unpack the whole context of the verse and the chapter around it and what God's doing and, and each of those promises that are just in those six verses. And over the next six days, go through them and spend some time studying. Wow, look at the promise. God, when he is near us relationally, what he does, I want that. May our faith be increased as we study and spend time. If I, if I spend time in the world, it's gonna produce fear. If I spend time in his word, it's gonna produce freedom. Does that mean we stick our head in the sand? No, it doesn't. But it also means we take seriously the command to no longer be conformed to the patterns of this world. That yeah, I watch the news, and yeah, I need to know what's going on, but when I find my truth and my reality, I go here. I go here. Um, Okay, this is not a, a formula. And so I, I wanna show you something though that's been very helpful for me as I think through this process. But I wanna be real clear. What we're seeing in scripture, and I don't think the Lord does this very often, of just give us a formula that we type in a code and then, and then this peace will happen or then this rejoicing will happen. But I do think God gives us a pathway. And so I'm a visual person. And so this was real helpful for me. I have a kind of a picture of a pathway uh, that, that's helpful to just kind of see how this process um, happens in our life. And so uh, we'll We'll put it up here on the screen in a second, but it starts with drawing near, that we draw near to a God and that we trust that we would draw near to a God, that our trust increases. And so uh, believing he is near, I think is our starting point for how we choose to rejoice. This very complicated command needs a complicated answer. And so as we believe he is near, that should then propel us into a prayer life. As we study his word and continue to increase our trust, well, then that should produce prayer in our life. And you'll see throughout the rest of this passage that prayer should turn into peace and that peace should turn into protection and it becomes a, a cycle in our life that builds up higher and higher. And so I, I wanna show you where this prayer is fueled from. In verse six, Paul says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Gratitude is fueled by prayer. 
our gratitude and this change in our hearts and our lives is fueled by our prayer life. The attitude in which we approach our God is, is crucial in this verse. It says that we are, are to pray with thanksgiving, right? That, that our prayer life is this thankful, thanksgiving thing. And I, if I'm honest, I don't know that my prayer life is always very well-rounded. Uh, I think a lot of times uh, I don't bring him everything, as this passage calls me to. I, I'm, not, I'm not bringing him everything. I'm only bringing him the crisis moments, right? Those, those moments that I refer to as the night before the big test moments or before we've got this big project due or before we've got uh, this big presentation or these big decisions that we have, then oftentimes those are the times when I go as opposed to um, someone who's near the Lord and brings him everything. And if I am really drawing near to the Lord and increasing my trust in that, well, then I want to bring him everything I wanna bring him my requests and my supplications. I wanna bring him with thanksgiving everything because I trust him because I know who he is. I know his promises. And so I wanna bring him everything. When I was a kid, I, I, this is weird, so don't judge me for this. Uh, but when I was a kid, I used to tell God jokes. I don't know why I thought it was a good idea, but I was a little kid and, and someone had taught me about prayer or would have a relationship with God. And so I remember as a little kid, um, I would tell God Aggie jokes. Please, Aggies, don't email me horrible things, okay? I was a kid, all right? I was young, immature. My wife was an Aggie. Please, no angry emails. But yeah, I, I thought it was the funniest thing ever. I heard an Aggie joke, and I would then go and tell God my Aggie joke. I'm, I'm not suggesting you tell God jokes. But I think there's something that I've lost in my childlike faith I don't know that I run and bring him everything the way he asks me to bring him everything in verse six of Philippians four. I wanna bring him everything. I wanna bring him my anxieties. I wanna bring him my requests. I wanna bring him my victories. I wanna bring him my conversations. I wanna bring him my anxieties and my dreams and my visions and hopes for the future and my fears. That we would do what it says to bring him everything with this Thanksgiving, we've got to prioritize time to pray. If we want this how to happen in our lives, we've got to increase our trust that he is near, but we've also got to prioritize prayer. Those go one and two, and our prioritization of prayer has to happen. Um, for me in this season, it looks really different uh, because no longer, prayer used to be something that was a, a location. I needed to find my spot to pray and my spots to pray were in car rides and when I would get to the office early or maybe after my family had gone to bed would be kind of more my elongated times of prayer. And now with isolation and everybody in the house and we're all sheltering in place, uh, it's no longer, there's no longer a place, it's a time. And so now uh, for the last couple of weeks, I, I'm a night owl, uh, but I now wake up at 5.30 in the morning because I know that is the only, the only place I have to pray is the time of day before my kids get up. Um, because when they get up, it's, it's game over. Prioritize prayer. In your life, prioritize it. Find the time, the place, make that a priority. Give a, give a complicated answer to a complicated depth of hurt and anxiety by making this a real priority in your life and seeking after uh, prayer in, a, in an all-inclusive way, in a well-rounded way that we would be people who bring him everything out of the nearness that we experience with him. And then uh, from that prayer comes peace. Peace comes from this. Look, look at the passage. Uh, in, in verse six, it says, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be, known, be, be made known to God. And then verse seven and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. My gratitude is buoyed by peace. It is, it, it is buoyed by peace in my life. Peace is a product we see in scripture uh, it is a product of this process of me trusting in this God, drawing near and trusting that he really is who he said he is, spending time bringing him all of my requests. And when I do that, there should be this, this peace that should surface, that should uh, buoy. Am I trusting he is near? Am I bringing him everything? And I love the imagery of a, of a buoy. Um, I, I was intentional because I, 
I think of a buoy. A buoy is, it's going to float. It's going to float on top of the water. And if storms come, it's gonna get splashed and it's gonna get thrown around. But at the end of the day, it is going to end up floating on the top of that water. And peace is a designed byproduct as we lean into the Lord and the depth of our trusting who he is produces a depth of peace that rises to the surface in our life. It buoys to the surface and that becomes an indicator light to even help me understand, am I really doing this well? Am I really understanding the how? Am I really walking through this process to rejoice the way I'm supposed to? I can check the indicator light in my life of peace. Man, there is no peace. Okay, I gotta go back to square one and I gotta start trusting his presence is, is real in my life. And I gotta start building my faith in his presence and I start taking in my request. And is, is there, okay, peace is maybe beginning to come more and more as this indicator that, man, this process is happening. Peace is not contingent on understanding either. And I think this is massively important. Peace isn't contingent on my understanding of what's going on. Um, I want it to be. But in verse seven, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, I wanna know what's going on. I wanna know, I wanna be in control. I wanna understand why. I wanna know if we flattened the curve. I want a timeline for how long. I, I wanna understand. We're not allowed that always. And what scripture is saying is peace isn't contingent on those things. I get it. I get it. My job, my finances, my relationships, my health, my loved one's health. So many things that we might not have understanding on, but God says that's not mutually exclusive to my peace. Some of the sweetest times in worship for me have been in times where we were going through crazy grief without understanding. Uh, before we had our two boys, uh, we, had, uh, we lost two babies. Uh, we had two miscarriages, Danielle and I did. And those were grieving times, right? That was, there was just a grief connected to that um, that felt overwhelming uh, at times. And we really had to get to the place where we ask ourselves, do we trust that he's still good? And after the second miscarriage, you start to think, well, man, this is, um, this is starting to be a pattern in my life. This isn't, uh, this isn't just one miscarriage, this is two miscarriages, and maybe this is gonna be a, a thing forever, and maybe we'll never be able to have kids, and, and all of these questions that I don't have answers for, and nobody's gonna be able to give me the right answers for, and and man, some of the sweetest worship. I actually remember, uh, I got up to church on a Sunday morning early and my responsibilities hadn't started and I remember I went into the high school worship service. It was happening in the Den in the Fort Worth campus and actually Drew Hill was leading worship. He used to be a long time ago the high school worship leader and I remember standing up against the back wall and just worshiping. Worshiping and rejoicing because I didn't understand and I was hurting. But the peace of God said, I'm still good. And I was still able to say, you are good even when I don't understand it. And even when it hurts. And even when I don't have the answers that I want and that I'm asking for, you're still good. And some of the sweetest worship in my life has been in those seasons. His peace isn't contingent on our understanding and it's not contingent on our circumstances. I don't know where you're at. I don't know what you're struggling with. I don't know the complexities of the hurt and the chaos and the dysfunction. I don't know those things. But there is a God who is in control, who draws near to you, who does. And he is still good and he is still worthy of worship. Would our hearts believe that? Would we believe and with the areas that that belief is still shallow, would he help us believe even more? And we would take him our request and we would see that peace buoyed and as that happens, we see our gratitude is protected by his presence. It says uh, at the end of this verse, the very last section, it says, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And so that, that, that idea of his gratitude, it's being protected by his presence because he's near. And I'm gonna show you that, that circle one more time, that, that sphere, that process in our life, but we see that there is this protection that happens. We believe he's near and we take him everything and this peace seems to start to rise up which indicates, okay, we're on the right path and that protects our hearts and our minds, which our hearts and our minds are the battlefield, which, which next week, do not miss next week. Cody is gonna do a deep dive in how we fight that battlefield. But 
God's peace becomes a protection for us. And as we are protected from those lies and more doubt, instead of spiraling down, we spiral up. We spiral up and we believe even more that he's near. And then we pray harder and we see more peace. Then that protects our hearts and it protects our minds. And our belief grows deeper and deeper and deeper. It's so important. Real quickly and and finally, I want to show you what it might look like when we're not living in this way. Um, Real quickly, I just want to show you this is so often what our default is. My default is doubt. And that doubt then turns into unproductive coping mechanisms. Those can be unhealthy, dangerous things, or they could just be checking out and numbing myself and and watching TV. And and instead of dealing with my doubt and taking it to the Lord, I just want to check out and ignore it and I cope. And then when I cope, all of a sudden anxiety floats because this didn't have any actual solution for my doubt. This didn't produce anything for me. It just numbed things, but the root was still there and so the anxiety floats to the top and that leaves me just vulnerable to doubt more. And I spiral down instead of spiraling up. This process is not a switch to flip. It's a muscle to build, to rejoice. To choose to rejoice is a muscle for us to build. It's a process that we would continue to grow in and seek him and draw near to him and be in his word and prioritize prayer and surrender the things that we don't understand. That's what this, that's what this is process for, to build that spiritual muscle so that we might be able to rejoice. We might be able to say, yes, I will worship you even when my heart is heavy because I know who you are and I'm beginning to trust more and more who you are. Last thing I'll say is this. I was talking to Cody uh, on Wednesday night and we were chatting um, over the phone and just about what was going on and specifically about this passage. And one of the things he said uh, that stuck with me is he said, so often we trust God with our eternity, but we don't trust him with our today. And that hit me because we trust him with our eternity so often. But am I trusting him with my today? Am I trusting him with my finances? Am I trusting him with my health? Am I trusting him with my today? And that's difficult to do. It's not an overly simplified answer. It's a process to build muscle that my faith might increase. And so would we do that, Christ Chapel? Would we take baby steps towards trusting he is near today and leaning into him in prayer and letting go of what we don't understand? And if you have never trusted him, if you're sitting on a couch or in a car or at a breakfast table and you're hearing this and you think, I've never really put my trust in him for my eternity, would today change everything for you? Would today you realize that you have a God who desires to relationally be near you and all of your sin and all of your past and all of your baggage and all that separates you has been paid for by the cross of Christ. And if you would surrender to him, accept his forgiveness, he's calling you home. Let's prioritize prayer right now. Transition over to Cody, who's gonna lead us in a time to do just that. You know, this piece that Ben just talked about, it's not available apart from God. It's only available through him, just as he talked about how he's that buoy in the midst of the storm. And we can draw near to him, and one of the ways we do that is by prioritizing prayer. And if we're gonna put his message into practice, then that means we need to prioritize it right now. And so what I'm gonna ask you to do is will you give yourself to God for the next two minutes? And what I mean by that is would you set every distraction aside? I know that there are distractions all around your home right now. And that's why we bow our heads. That's why we close our eyes. That's why we may even fold our hands. You see, when I bow my head, I'm not looking up and looking around. That's why I close my eyes. To focus on giving myself unto the Lord and hearing what he's saying to me. And I even fold my hands so, one, I can't hold anything. I can't hold my phone or the remote control or anything else. And it also reminds me that God's holding on to me. And so would you bow your head, would you close your eyes, and would you fold your hands to give yourself completely to God right now, that he might give you his peace as we pray to him. I'm gonna lead you through some things that you can pray. And first, we're just gonna start by drawing near to God. I'm gonna tell you this, I've learned this in my walk with the Lord, that God goes where he's invited. Would you invite God into your life right now, maybe for the first time? 
maybe for the first time today, would you say, God, I wanna be near you and you are welcome in my life, in my heart, and in my mind right now. Please come, come into my life. You know, when Paul says, don't be anxious about anything, you go, how is that even possible? And as Ben said, it assumes that we can be anxious about things in this world. And that's why in 1 Peter 5, 7, it says, cast all your anxiety on Jesus because he cares for you. You see, there's a place to put that anxiety that you're feeling right now. Your shoulders aren't big enough to shoulder the load of your anxiety your worries, your cares, but there's someone who cares for you and that's Jesus. Would you tell him what you're worried about right now? Would you cast your anxiety on him and say, Jesus, I can't carry this. I'm worried about this situation. I'm worried about this relationship. I'm worried about my finances. Can I give those worries to you? Yes, you can right now. Give them to him. Ben pointed out that that peace, it it protects us. That God's nearness, his proximity protects us. His peace protects us. Where do you need protection right now? Where are you feeling particularly vulnerable? Is it a temptation? Is it your health? Maybe you're not even anxious about you being protected, but it's someone else. Maybe you have a loved one in the medical field. Would you pray for God's protection in your life and in others' lives as well? Now let's go back to the beginning. Let's come full circle and have an attitude of gratitude. Let's end there. What are you thankful for? Can you fill in that list and just say, God, I'm grateful for this. You're sitting in his presence. You understand his promises. He's giving you his peace. He promises he'll protect you. What are you grateful for? God, I thank you that we're not going at this alone, that you've given us your spirit and that you've given us your body, the body of Christ, that we can lean on you and we can lean on one another, that we can not only cast our anxiety on you because you care for us, but Lord, we can care for one another by sharing our burdens with each other, by praying for one another by experiencing that peace that only comes through your body. 
Lord, thank you for drawing near to us. Thank you for being shoulders broad enough that we can cast our anxiety on you. Thank you for your protection, your provision. Thank you that when we don't understand what we're going through, we fall on you, that you lift us up. Thank you for being our God, a shelter of peace in times of trouble. We can't say thank you enough. In Jesus' name, amen. to praise. I know that you have because you chose to join with us and we are all going to choose to praise God together. There are things to be grateful for and I want you to walk through this week with an attitude 
of gratitude and to stay engaged because we are going to get through this together. And Owen has some ways that he'll explain to you in just a moment uh, of ways that you can stay engaged with us uh, as a body, that we can support each other to get through this crazy time because this time will end. And we are listening to federal and state officials about the time when we can gather together again physically, but we're not gonna do that till we can assure you of your safety, that we can make sure that we are doing it properly in a way that is safest for all who are involved. But until that time, we're gonna continue to be the church because the church is not a building, the church is a body of believers. That's you and that's me. And we're gonna continue to be that church without walls. So Christ Chapel this week, don't just shelter in place. Would you please shelter in peace? God bless you. Have a good week. What a great reminder today that God is near and that because of Jesus, we always have reasons to hope. I hope you carry that truth with you this week. I know it's easier said than done, but let's keep trusting the Lord and what he has for us in these days. Let's read his word, let's pray, and let's keep connecting. Just hanging out with you and being reminded that God is near has been such an encouragement to me today, and we're not done yet. Remember that we're ready for you at Starting Point. This is your first stop for all of the questions you have about God, our church, or anything else you wanna talk about. Click the links that are being posted in the chats and join us over there now. And don't forget that at Starting Point, in the chat, and a bunch of other ways, you can let us know how to pray for you. If the news is hitting you hard, if it's tense at home, if things feel off in a relationship, if someone you know has the virus, or literally anything else, we want to be a friend and show up for you. Click Live Prayer, post in the chat now, or email, call, or text me so we can be praying for whatever is going on. Right now, things may feel upside down, but we can lean into what God is doing and shelter in peace. If something comes up later this week, reach out to us and be sure you're checking our website, ccbcfamily.org throughout the week. You can find everything for Sundays there, plus resources for children, students, and everything else that I've talked about today. I've loved being with you. Click those links, reach out to us throughout the week, and I'll see you all back here online next Sunday for our last message of Shelter in Peace. See you then.